So I, I think I'm going to try and uh, <clears throat> answer a question, which is a very deep question, and I believe I'm going to give uh, my take on the the answer to the question. Um, it's the answer that I thought about for quite a while now. Um, and I have some indications of the uh, that it's an answer. The question really is, we know that God started, this, God uh, wanted to give the Zulasai Olam Haba. <clears throat> but God first wants the Zulasai to fix the problem of Nam Sufa. And I try to explain it and so on. Basically, Nam Sufa comes from the ability of the Zulasai to see himself by himself. So therefore, what that does to the Zulasai, it makes him somewhat independent of everyone. We call that independence a centrality because it means that the Zulasai is central to reality. He is the beginning and the end of reality because reality emerges from him, from his consciousness, his awareness. And that gives him something, a certain kind of possible power. It makes him fundamentally independent of everything else. Since reality, in a certain way, comes from him because he knows himself by himself, so he constitutes the center of knowledge, the center of reality. Because his knowledge of himself does not come from reality. It comes from something called the itself, uh, the essence of his being, that he has a knowledge of himself. And that makes him somewhat outside of reality. It makes him somewhat outside and it makes him the center of reality. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is that it interferes <clears throat> with God's ability to be a native because God wanted to do something very good for the Zulasai and give him the ability to know God, to be dovic, to be attached to God. And that would uh, reinforce his sense of himself because his sense of himself comes from God. Don't forget what I said was that God did not create the Zulasai in the normal way where he created the Zulasai from nothing, even though that's generally <clears throat> the way that it's stated. But God derived the Zulasai from his own sense of himself. How he did that is unknown, completely unknown. But the one thing unique about God is this fact. God knows himself by himself. That one, you know, that, that's a fundamental way to define God. He knows that he is through his own awareness of himself. And where does he get his awareness from himself? It's not part of a reality. God is beyond reality. God has in itself in some way which we cannot begin to comprehend. He is the act of awareness itself. His sense of self and his awareness are identical. There's no difference between the two. In other words, God is himself in the ultimate absolute way. So God's knowledge of himself is himself. And that, that answers another very deep question of existence. Why do we exist? What is existence? Existence is the fact that in some way we sense that we are. We really can't define existence because it goes beyond any other concept. And we do not see the concept that existence is part of. There's no higher concept than existence. So therefore, it lacks a definition. Because the definition of an object is who it is and what part of reality is it does it belong to? 
that God doesn't have any reality whatsoever. He is himself totally. So understanding that's what God, God somehow was able to, to in a certain sense, uh, transfer, I should say, or extend that feeling of being yourself and knowing yourself by yourself. He was able to transmit this feeling from himself, which is, constitutes who he is, to another being called the Zulosoi. That's why the essence of the Zulosoi is denoted by the word Zulas. The word Zulosoi comes from the word Zulas. And what does the word Zulas mean? It means uh, outside of. It means uh, besides other. The word Zulas means other. And the concept of other means that the being is totally independent of anything else. So the Zulosso is the only being that God uh, developed or derived that has a sense of himself, and here's the key, by himself. He does not have the sense of himself as a figure of reality like animals. Animals know who they are because we see that they're afraid whenever they're attacked. So therefore, they must have some kind of sense of self. But this sense of self is part of a reality. It's actually outside of them. It's not in them and through them. It's outside of them. But a, a, a zulosoi is a, or a man is totally different than an animal because his sense of self comes from a self, which he is. It is called the itself. He knows that he is by himself. And this creates a certain problem because God made a, a human being, a, a person, so high that he possesses the one trait that God has to some extent. He knows himself by himself, which means that he's outside of everything. And that outside is actually an independent facet which he has that he does not share with anything else. So this quality that a human has is called Namadik Sufa because it gives a person a sense of its independence. Independence from who? From God. Because he knows that he is. He knows that he exists by himself, through himself. And of course, we have no concept of what that really is. But that concept does something very strange. It entitles a being who has that knowledge of himself by himself to exist. That's, you see, we think that existence is a privilege. We think that it's a gift. It is a gift and so on. But who is entitled to that gift? Where does existence belong? Where is, where is, where, where is it is applicable? You can either exist or you don't exist. So what determines what if something exists? Ask yourself, what determines if something exists? Why do I exist as opposed to I don't exist? And if you don't exist, you don't know yourself. You don't know that you are. And the answer to that question is that uh, fundamentally that accrues to a, to, a, to a being who is what? Who is beyond uh, existence. Existence is not normally something that a something has. The general principle is that everything does not exist. And existence only appears, <clears throat> you see, on something which deserves to have it. And what deserves to have it? something which has awareness, something which is aware of himself, knows that he is. So existence is really nothing more than awareness. But it's an awareness that you possess on your own. Therefore, that's the reason why God exists. God has a knowledge of himself by himself. Truly, he's the only thing, Enoid Morvadoi, He's the only thing that possesses it. So, therefore, 
an entity which knows itself by itself has what's called existence. But we don't call it existence at that level. Awareness is existence on the level of what? On the level of a being who is aware, who is a self which is aware. That's where existence as a process adheres into. It's there. It's a very difficult question about who is entitled to exist. Who is entitled to exist so that we say that he exists. And that's a being who is aware of himself by himself. That is the only being that is entitled to exist. I hope that I'm being somewhat uh, abstract, very abstract. But this is the reason why something exists, only because of aware. So if you don't possess awareness of yourself by yourself, you have nothing to do with existence. Existence is not something that something shares in. It's not a process that something shares in because uh, you have it. You don't normally have existence. It only appears in people, in the being, which is what? Which is aware of itself. Because awareness is the process where you are manifest. And since God is the only being who's aware of himself, by himself, he's the only thing which exists. Nothing can exist that does not have that property or that, tr- that, that concept. And God shared this concept that he knows himself by himself with another being. And that's called the Zulasoi. But when you are aware of yourself by yourself and you share that trait that God has, something strange happens. You don't want to be Dovic to God. You see, this is the contradiction, the ultimate contradiction. The Zulasoi does not want Olam Haba. Why? Because the Zulasoi says, I don't need to be Dovic to you. I don't need to be attached to you, God, because I am an independent entity. I know myself by myself. So therefore, I don't need you to exist. I don't need you to be manifest. Why? Because I know myself by myself. So therefore, that quality that we possess, a similar characteristic of God, that he knows himself by himself, the Zulasa shares this to some extent with God. But by sharing this, the Zulasai, what? The Zulasai does not want to be Dovic to God. It doesn't need to be Dovic God. And this is the problem. And where, where do we see this problem? We see this problem by Shri Sakalim. That when the Oris of the Spheres went into the Kalim, the Kalim broke. Because the Kalim, the vessels which contain the awe, the light of the Spheres, was not strong enough to hold them. It didn't have the Kedusha to be able to hold that light. So therefore, the Kalim, the vessels, broke. But what's the real reason why they broke? It's not that they couldn't hold the light. That's what's normally said. The Kalim could not contain the light of the spheres, the ore. So the Kalim broke. So our task is, to uh, replace the, to fix the kalim so that it can hold the light. So everyone thinks that Shri's a kalim is because the kalim was not able to hold the light of the spheres. But what I'm saying is completely different. It's not that they couldn't hold the light. They didn't want to hold the light. Why? Because they didn't think they needed the light from the sphere, the iris, they didn't think they needed it. Why? Because they have a certain feeling the Kalim, which is the Zulasa, <clears throat> believes that it doesn't need the light of the spheres because it can be manifest by itself. It's independent of the light of the spheres. So therefore, it rejected the light of the spheres in the belief that it doesn't need it. 
it can have its own. So therefore, it rejected the light of the spheres, and that's called that the Kalim broke. What does it mean, broke? It means it was an act of rejection. It was not an act of inadequacy, that it wasn't strong enough. It's an act of rejection. So that's exactly what Namnik Sufa is. <clears throat> Namnik Sufa is that you reject a gift. So what the, the statement is, you reject the gift. Why? Because you feel disempowered. But what does that mean, you feel disempowered? It's, it's not that you're actually disempowered, but you feel disempowered because you feel independent. And you can hold your own existence by yourself. So you don't need someone giving you the light to exist. So that's what God realized, that when God understood that when you create the Zulasai, you're creating the greatest thing that was ever made, or you're deriving the greatest thing that you ever made. Because you're actually making something or you're deriving something which has a sense of its own independence. And where did it get that sense of its own independence? How could God create a Zulasai which is outside, which sees itself as outside of God? You know? And the answer is because it gave the Zulasai a piece of himself. God gave the Zulasai a piece of himself, which is the itself of the Zulasai. I mean, so I'm sorry, the, which is the, the self of God. God also has an itself. He knows himself by himself. But he is one with himself. And that fundamental characteristics, which is described by Ein Oid Mulvadoi, there is nothing else but God. You know, he has in itself, which is completely independent of everything possible. And he gave a piece of that to the Zulasai. So therefore, the Zulasai sees itself as someone outside of God. And this is what Davar HaMelech says. That man was created slightly less than God. What do you mean? And that's what it means when God said to the, he says, Adam, kid Husseinu, kid kid let's make man in our image. What does our image mean? Our image means in the sense that we know ourselves by ourselves. That's the essence of God. Except that he knows himself by himself because he is one with himself. But the Zulasa is not one with himself, but he knows himself by himself also. But this gift that God wants to give the Zulasa and allow the Zulasa in Oilam Abba constitutes that which makes the Zulasa reject God's gift. So this is the, a tremendous Chiddush. God created something which is very, to some extent, like him in the independence that he has. But once he created that entity, that entity doesn't want to share God's existence. It doesn't want to love God, you see, because it sees itself as outside of God. And when you see yourself as outside of God, you don't think that you need God to be manifest. But that's an illusion because the Zulasa needs God because its sense of independence and the fact that it believes it doesn't need God comes from God. You see, this is the contradiction. And I hope I'm making myself clear. The notion that the Zulosa sees itself by itself comes from God. So therefore, the reality is that it needs God because it needs to be derived from God. If God doesn't derive the Zulosa from himself, from the central trait that he has, it doesn't exist. Yet that's the one thing that will force the Zulosoi to say, I don't need you. And that is the cause of the Sri Zakalim. I don't need the all which empowers me because I am independent of that light. Because why? I know myself by myself without the assistance of you. So that's the ultimate contradiction of what? Of Namdik Sufa that the creation of the Zulosai for the purpose of Atava, to give the, uh, the Zulosai a gift of eternity, is exactly which would force the 
Zulosoi to reject that gift because it sees itself as outside of God. So there's an ultimate contradiction. In other words, God understood that if you create something which is similar to him in the sense that it is absolutely independent of everything, it's going to reject your desire to give it existence or give it a manifestation that will last forever, beyond time. It will reject it because it believes it's independent. So Nam Sufa is the deepest problem of all. And reality, anything in reality like an animal or a plant that has a sense of itself does not have a sense of itself as outside of God. Because God is the reality that gives all entities their self-awareness to the extent their self-awareness is embedded in the reality outside of them, whereas the Zulosa's sense of self-awareness is embedded in him. His sense of self is outside of everything else. So therefore, he thinks that he's independent. So the problem of Namak Sufa is the ultimate problem. And God realized this. So that's why God is so insistent that the Zulosa is mistaken the problem of Namak Sufa. Because if he's not mistaken the problem of Namak Sufa, which comes from his own internal essence of the Zulosa, he will not go, he will not want, he cannot be dubbed to the Bernishan in Oilam Abba. So I hope that we all understand it. Uh, it's hard to describe exactly what that problem is, but I think I, I've done that. So therefore, that's why God, and, so, and that explains why there's such a thing called evil or punishment or pain. Why does God create a world in which there is pain? Where does the pain come from? Well, the pain forces the Zulosoi to exceed to God. It shows the Zulosoi that he is fundamentally vulnerable and he is not God. He is not absolutely independent of God. On the contrary, he's derived from God because God creates the circumstances of pain and pain shows the Zulosoi that he is not outside of God. He is not the center of, of all reality. So God must give him pain when he defies God as his uh, deriver, as the one who derived him, so that he can bask in Olam Haba. Because the ultimate question that everyone has about God, really, the ultimate question that everyone has about God is that God is the ultimate giver. What does that mean, the ultimate giver? God cannot do anything except to give. God cannot take. The one thing that is outside of God is completely false of God. God cannot take anything because God doesn't need anything because he's absolutely independent of everything. So God doesn't know anything about the concept of taking, only giving. So in that case, why doesn't God want to give Olam Haba to the Zulosoi? And the answer is, God in a certain sense, cannot give that. Why? Because his sense of independence will cause the Zulosoi to reject dependence on God because he believes he's independent. You see? So that's why God says to him, you must solve the problem of Namak Sufa or else you can never live, you cannot live in Olam Haba without a feeling of disempowerment. And since you have this feeling of disempowerment, because you are dependent on me, I'm sorry to say, but God says to the Zulosoi, the fact of the matter is, you are dependent on me, and your whole feeling of independence comes from me. But that's, the, that's only a fiction. The truth is that I gave you the feeling of independence. So in that sense, you are for me. You are dependent on me. You are not outside of me. I gave you the perception of you being outside of me and being independent of me. But that's only your perception. That's not the truth. 
But since you think it's the truth, because it constitutes your essence, that you know yourself by yourself, you will think that you're independent of me, and you will reject Olam Haba, which is what I give you. When it says, uh, you will not take the Ashpa of the Shina as your reward in Olam Haba. Why? Because you don't believe that you need that Ashpa, because you already exist by yourself, for yourself. So you have to solve the problem by yourself. I cannot solve it for you. And you have to massacre in your own Namdik Sufa, or else you will not accept my Olam Haba freely, as long as you think that you're outside of me. So that's why the central tachlis of the Zulasai is to realize that even though his perception that he's independent of God, that's what he sees, and that's his essence, that he has this quality of independence coming from God. <clears throat> but since it's coming from God, he is dependent on God. So he's committed to something which is false, and unless he discovers that that perception is false, he will not accept all of my Bob. So that's why God gives pain. That's why God does this. Why? God cannot give the Zulosoy Oilam Haba because he would reject it. And in the end, that's what he has to do. The Zulosoy has to fix that problem by himself. But the question that we now ask is what? How many Zulasoys did God create? It's a very strange question. In other words, in the beginning, God created one Zulasoy, Adam Mauritian. He was the only Zulasoy that God created. And God told them, you have to fix your problem of Dhamma Sufa, like I just explained. But Adam Mauritian was the only example of man. There was no other example. All this known species of man, mankind as a species, which is called mankind, did not exist in Adam. It did not exist with Adam Mauritian. Adam Mauritian was the first and only man to exist. All other men that were, came after the hate of Adam Mauritian came from the mind of Adam Mauritian. We were once all part of Adam Mauritian. We were part of his self. So the question is, how many people are part of the other religion self? What determines the number of people that God made after the sin of other religion, after he sinned, other religion suddenly fragmented into mankind. And the original other religion, who was the sum total of all of mankind, disappeared. But the question is, how many people did other religion become? What? The only original Zulasai was Adam Mauritian and Chava. There was no one else. They were all part of the mind of Adam Mauritian and Chava. So once he fragmented into what's called mankind in a species, how many independent people were there? Because mankind is a species where each human, each person, each Zulasai has a separate mind of himself. He has a separate self. So therefore, this awareness suddenly spread on many different selves. So the question is, how many selves did God uh, take mankind from other regions? Did he, take, did he make other regions into two people, five people, a thousand people, ten thousand, six? I mean, how many people eventually can be derived from what from other regions? So we can say, well, God wants to be native, so he wants to be native to many people. Well, how many is many? Why does God need many people to be a native? Technically, God could be a native. He can do good to just one person, and that would qualify. And that's why Adam Mauritian, when he was created in the beginning, when he was derived from God, was only one person. There was no such thing as mankind. So now that there is such a thing called mankind after the hate, how many people are part of mankind? What is it? What is the number of that? 
So this question used to bother. So in other words, the question can be put in another form. What is a man? What does it mean, a person? That's the question. The question, what is a person? As we look out there, we see many, many people. What is the essential definition of a person? That he knows himself by himself? Yes, that is. But we see that mankind is a species. So there are many different examples of a person. So how many people did God create? That depends on the definition of what a person is. But what is that definition? Can you have five people or ten people or a million people or a billion people? I mean, it's endless. Where does God stop in making independent individuals with these all examples of uh, knowing oneself by oneself? What is the, the ultimate total of all of mankind? Does mankind have a stretch? Does it have a limit? You know, it's, for some reason, you can only have uh, a million people. You can have a million separate individuals who know themselves by themselves, and that's it. Or maybe 10 million, or 20 million, or 100 million. You know, it's, what is the end of that? Is there an end to that? So what I'm asking really is, what is a person? And how many people would satisfy God in terms of being a native? So I'm going to try and answer this question. It's on. But that's the question. What is the definition of a person? What is a person? What's the difference between you and me? Now we see from the Medrash a very important concept. That when it comes to Namdik Sufa, there are many parts of Namdik Sufa. What does that mean? Every person who was ever born, ever existed, you know, has a specific task and his task is different than the task given over to anyone else so each person that's created is the creation of a different part of Nam Sufa what does that mean? that means Nam Sufa is not one problem but Nam Sufa is a multiple problem, it's a multiplicity and each person who's created has a certain chilek or a certain portion of what that Nam Sufa is. What does that mean? What does that mean that he has a certain portion, that he has to fix his portion of Nam Sufa? You know what I mean? That's a very strange concept. That means that I have a certain portion. When I came down to the world, I, the definition of myself as a person was that I had to fix my own Namdik Sufa. And my Namdik Sufa is different than your Namdik Sufa. Yes, as different than someone else's Namdik Sufa. Each person is not simply another example of a species of the Zula. Sorry, it's not. It represents a unique individual piece of Namdik Sufa that only belongs to that person. It does not belong to anyone else, and therefore it cannot be fixed by anyone else. That's the definition of a person. So the definition of a person is a certain uh, type of Namdik Sufa that's unique to that person that can only be fixed by that person. So therefore we see every person who was ever made since all the Mauritian before the sin, and that divided into the species called mankind, was given a certain piece of Namdik Sufa that is not duplicated by another person. So the question is, what is that? How could Namdik Sufa be divided? Namdik Sufa is the general feeling that I know myself by myself. I have an itself, which is unique. Okay, but that itself is unique, and the Namdik Sufa of that itself is unique to that person. Well, what does that mean? If we can have some understanding of that, we can have some kind of grasp of why God created the exact number of people that he made, that he derived. So 
So what I think is the answer to that problem has to do with the concept of spheres. You see, what is a sphere? A sphere is composed of a light, a hashpah. And the light that the spheres are composed of uh, divide into three hanogas. There are ten spheres, which means that when the, the light of the sphere is differentiated, it's differentiated into ten spheres. And that's all. And what are these ten spheres? What exactly, why is this, do the number of spheres ten? Well, I'm going to uh, I want to say this in a shear. I'm not going to say this in this shear. You know what I mean? But I'm going to give a shear up ahead that will define each of the ten spheres, why they were individual spheres. But fundamentally what we know, that the ten spheres are really replications of three Hanogas. That when God created the concept of Hanogas, of the way he treats, the way he supervises uh, his creation or derivation, is that these Tranogas are Chesed, Din, and Rachemim. That's what it is. And Chesed, Din, and Rachemim, which are called the three Hanhogas of the Vernachonim, subdivide into ten spheres. That's the structure of a sphere. There are ten spheres. Originally, all the spheres were undifferentiated into a supernoga. And that supernoga subdivided into three anogas, chesed, to give existence when you don't deserve it, when you haven't done anything to earn it. That's called chesed. Din, when you give existence or manifestation, when you did something to deserve it, you worked for it, you earned it. But more than that, you corrected yourself in that, and Rachamim, so that even though you don't deserve it, you still can get it because God gives a certain mechanism where you can atone. You can do tshuva and atone. So the definition of chesed din and Rachamim is that. Chesed is when you're given something for free. <clears throat> you having done nothing to, to deserve it or to qualify for it. The second Hanoga is Wadin, where you do something, an action which is considered a cause. You become the cause of a certain action which produces your ability to be manifest in the Mahabo. That's called Din. There is a cause and effect relationship in Din. There is no cause and effect relationship in Chesed. Because the reason why you get Olam Haba in the leader of Chesed is why? Because God loves you. That's it. He is the cause and he is the effect. God loves you and he has derived you from him without you doing anything or contributing to that. That's called Chesed. But when suddenly you have to do something to qualify for that, you see it, that's called Din. So Din created concept of cause and effect where you are the cause and you are the effect. And Rachman, the final one, is what? Is where you've done something to disqualify yourself from manifestation or existence. You disqualify yourself. But nevertheless, God gives you another mechanism called mercy or compassion where you can rectify this. Uh, that which you disqualified, you can remove the disqualification by a certain means, either by chuva or by suffering and so on. So the anogas which put a person in the Ulamaba are three, chesedin and rachamim. And these three are subdivided into ten spheres, each sphere being a certain light, a light of what? And this is a very critic that I'm about to say. The light of each sphere, from Kesed down to Malchus, the ten spheres, that light is actually, comes from God, in a certain sense. But that light, you have to understand, is the act of awareness itself. That's it. 
What is a sphere? A sphere is the light of awareness. It's the ability to be aware. That's called a light. And who does that belong to? Well, that belongs to the Zolosai. Because the fundamental being of the Zolosai is self-awareness. So when I say the Zolosai is self-aware, what does that mean? That means he's composed of the light of a sphere, the, the general sphere. That defines him. That says who he is. He is nothing more than a being, an entity, who is self-aware. How does he is self-aware? How? Through the concept of a sphere, a certain light. So what that light is, is an act of awareness. That's it. So therefore, it turns out that the spheres are the zulosoi. And the fact that the zulosoi is divided into ten spheres means that in some way his awareness is divided into ten subdivisions. That's right. There are ten spheres denoting chesed and rachmim because this is the awareness of the zulosoi. His awareness can be divided into ten levels, and these levels are chesed and nuachemim, because these are the levels which allow him to masakin nam nisufa. The teaching of nam nisufa, or the fallacy of his independence, can be fixed by three superanogas, chesed and nuachemim. So these, these lights are really his awareness of the three Hanogas that allow him to masakin his problem of Nam Sufa. And once he's masakin it, he can be Zoha to Olam Haba. Because as we said before, Nam Sufa is the rejection of Olam Haba by the Zulosoi because of his sense, his false sense of being independent by himself. But he corrects that through these three Hanogas. So the three Hanogas of Chesed and Rachamim subdivided into ten Hanogas is the very, constitutes the awareness of his actions as he begins to masakin his own problem of Nam Sufa. This is a very deep concept. And this concept means the following, that the Zulosoi is an act of self-awareness. And that act of self-awareness is constitutes what? The idea of a light. That's the metaphor. That's the symbol of the process of awareness. What is the definition of awareness? We don't know. What does it mean to be aware? What does it mean to be aware of oneself? I don't know. It's the essence of consciousness. The essence of consciousness is when you are aware of yourself. And that's the mind. That's the mind of the Zulosoi. So the mind of the Zulosoi is composed of ten lights or ten aspects of awareness. Chesed, Din, and Rachman. Why those three? Those three are the that allow you to have awareness. And that awareness creates the problem of Nam the Sufa. So Nam the Sufa is a, is a problem in awareness itself. So that means what? That he has the problem of awareness itself called Nam the Sufa. Okay. So therefore, if I want to make different people, that's how I can make different people. Each person has a different feature of awareness. One person has the feature of awareness of chesed. It knows his mind is the self-awareness that attaches the chesed. That he does not do anything to correct his nam sufa. Another person is connected to the awareness of din. So he realizes in himself that he has to do something to correct the disqualification 
a what of Namdik Sufa. So therefore, he has a mind which is composed of I got to do something to correct my problem of Namdik Sufa. And that awareness is the awareness of Din. So one person has the awareness of the Mid of Chesed. Another person has the awareness of the Mid of Din. Finally, you have another person who has the awareness of Rachamim. So he is the awareness of Rachamim. The other person is the awareness of Din. And the third person is the awareness of what? Of Chesed. So therefore we see that if a person is nothing more than a self-awareness, that self-awareness can be divided into three types. The awareness of Chesed, and therefore he has to be devoted to Chesed, the awareness of Din, and if he has to be devoted, he has to be devoted to Din and the awareness of Rachamim. Each awareness is different than the other. And that's why, that's what it means that the Zulasai depends on the essence of his awareness to tell him how he has to act. So the awareness that he's attached to, the type of awareness that he's attached to, defines himself as a person. You have a person who's based on chesed, you have a person who's based on din, and you have a person based on rachamim. Each of these people are different from each other, and they constitute the focus of his awareness. With the focus of the awareness of one person is chesed, the focus of awareness of another person is din, and the focus of awareness of the third person is rachamim. That means that the life of a person of din and the life of the person of what rachamim would be different. Because the person would act simply all the trials that he needs to activate the concept of din, to earn his position in olam haba. And the person whose focus is the awareness of Rachamim can fix himself. So his life is something about the awareness of Rachamim. And he could fix himself by doing sins. So therefore, what constitutes the Zulosa if the definition of a person is his awareness? And his awareness can have three different manifestations, Chesedin and Rachamim, and that therefore becomes the focus of his life in Olam Azer. So we begin to understand what the definition of a person is. The definition of a person is the focus of what his awareness is. And it differs for people. <clears throat> now there's a certain fact that you have to understand. The optimal level of Chesedin and Rachamim is when they interact. In other words, when Chesed, Din, and Rachamim constitute three different sets of awareness that are separate from each other, that's called Nekudim. What does it mean, Nekudim? Nekudim means that there's one sphere that represents Chesed, there's another sphere or another light that represents Din, and that there's another sphere which represents Rachamim. Each of these spheres are different lights that represented each or uh, different uh, Hanhogas. But the fact that these spheres are originally separated from each other is called Nikudam. Nikudam means, uh, uh, means a point. And each sphere is a different point. So therefore, the person is defined by the sphere that he constitutes his awareness. So now we understand something very critical. We understand the definition of a person. The definition of a person is the act of awareness itself. But that act of awareness could be about one of three different hanogas or supervisory qualities. And in that sense, these are three. That's why there has to be a minimal of three spheres. There has to be a minimal of three spheres. One sphere, one light, one hashpah that's devoted to the awareness of the action of chesed. There has to be one that's devoted to the action of din. And there has to be one that's devoted to the action of what? 
the action of Rachamim. But the Kabbalah tells us that the real mature level of the spheres is when all the spheres interact with each other. So the, the, act, the action of the spheres as Nikudim, where each one is separate from each other, is inadequate. They have to be unified so that all of them can interact. Chesed can interact with Din, and Chesed can interact with uh, Rachamim. Din can interact with Chesed and Rachamim, and Rachamim can interact with Chesed and Din. That's their optimal level. And at their optimal level, that combination is called ten spheres. So this is exactly what happens with the spheres. Originally, the spheres were undifferentiated, completely undifferentiated from each other. In that way, the spheres are referred to as akudam. Akud means but the bound together. They are not differentiated. And then when finally they are differentiated into three separate spheres of Chesed, Din, and Rachamim, they become what's called Nikudim, points, separate points, each one being an individual. And finally, the optimal level is when the three spheres interact with each other. So therefore we see to some extent exactly the nature of the human race. If each person represents a certain act of awareness that corresponds to the spheres, each person is a unique combination of the sphere. So then the question now becomes, if that's the definition of the person, how do they do it? How is, for example, chesed, how does it interact with din? And how does din interact with rachamim? since each one is defined differently. And this is the concept that will tell us how many people God has to make. Because God has to make the sum total of people through the combination of all ten. And how does God do this? So what it says, God does it in the following way. When we say the sphere of uh, Keser, which is the highest sphere of all, how does Keser interact with the other ones? So what God says, Keser, when you say Keser, you have to say the sphere does not exist alone. You have to say Keser as a combination with other spheres. So how does the Keser interact with Chochmah? So the answer is you have to make Chochmah a piece of Keser, and that describes the way Keser and Chochmah interact. But Keser has to interact with the other nine spheres as well. So what we see is a certain table. We see on the top the notion of Keser, which is a sphere that denotes Chesed. But the way it interacts with the other spheres is that each sphere becomes a part of Keser. So therefore, we have Keser divides into ten com combinations. It divides, it, 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 there's Keser Shebe Keser, there's Keser of Keser, which is pure Keser, and then there's Chochma of Keser, Keser in its combination with Chochma, Bina of Keser, of, Ke of Keser, Bina as it combines with Bina, as, well, as it combines with Keser. And then you have the other, uh, the other spheres. So therefore, it comes out that when you say Keser, Keser combined with who? And that means that there's another, there's ten spheres. Keser can combine with itself. That's pure Keser. It can combine with Chochmo. It can combine with Bina. It combines with Chesed, with Gevua. It combines with Teferis. It combines what with Netzach, with Hod, and with, with Yisod and Malchus. Kesa, therefore, can combine in an interaction with all ten of these things. So, therefore, we see that we, there used to be two spheres. There used to be two spheres. Let's say Kesa and Chochmah. Now, there are really 100 spheres. Because Kesa itself has ten different forms. 
Kesra has 10 forms. So that tells me that there are 10 different versions of Kesra. As I said, Kesra of Choch, Kesra of Kesra, Kesra of Chochmo, Kesra of Bino, Kesra of Chesed, Kesra of, of Gvur, Kesra of what first, Kesra of Netzach, Kesra of Hold, Kesra of Yisodin, Kesra of Malchus. There are 10 different versions of the sphere of Chesed in its combination with each separate sphere. So what used to be one sphere, an undifferentiated sphere, now becomes what? Ten spheres. Kesu alone the subdivides the ten different spheres, each one being a combination of Kesu with each of the other uh, ten. So now, if that's the case, with Kesa, that means that since the spheres are acts of awareness, there would be automatically 10 people. Why? Because there are 10 different versions of their combination. There are 10 versions of their combination. And therefore, the v- specific combination version represents one person. It represents the awareness of one person. And this is critical. So just like Kesser can combine and suddenly become 10 different combinations, each combination itself can be interact with the other, another 10 combinations. So now you have Kesser in combination with Chochma. That's a specific combination. Now Chochma which is the combination, is subdivided into also 10, the same 10. In other words, each sphere does not exist alone anymore. If each sphere existed alone, you'd have 10 different people constituting 10 different versions of a person. But each sphere now combines with 10, and each 10 combines with another 10. In other words, each sphere has its own subdivisions, the same subdivisions as the one above it. So now, when you are the undifferentiated, you have a person, the awareness of the person was undifferentiated, a sphere, the light, undifferentiated light. And the second thing is the sphere of Kesser, which is the differentiated form. But that sphere of Kesser, in its undifferentiated, in its differentiated form, has another 10 that it combines with. And now it's 10, 10 people. And what was 10 people now becomes 100 people. And what was 100 people now becomes 1,000. And what was 1,000 people becomes 10,000, 100,000, 1 million. So in other words, as we vertically go down and we subdivide each sphere, continuously as its interaction with each other sphere is part of it and so on. So therefore, the number of people that represent each combination is represented by each combination of the spheres. So you have a vertical tree. What used to be a horizontal tree of 10 spheres now becomes a vertical tree where you have Kesser and Kesa subdivides the ten. Each one of the each one of those further subdivides the ten. Each one of those further subdivides the ten. So with each division, where you have a further and further level of the division, you have more and more people because each per- person represents the awareness of a specific combination of spheres. At the first level, you just have Kesa. At the second level, you have 10 people. At the third level, you have what? You have 100 people. At the fourth level, you have what? You have 1,000 people. Each person corresponds to a certain level of awareness. And that level of awareness is symbolized by the interaction of all the spheres. So I hope I'm making myself clear. So now we understand the number of people that have to live. When God said, I'm going to subdivide you into mankind, what he meant was, I'm going to subdivide you from one person 
the original person into ten people. In other words, the original Adam Arishin Koidemachet was a total combination of what? Of all ten. And that itself becomes another further combination of another ten and another ten and another ten. So the vertical tree expands by the number 10. Odomarishan was represented as some total of all the acts of awareness. But once Odomarishan was divided into mankind, each division into mankind as an individual person represented a certain combination of these spheres. In other words, the question is now, what is the maximum level? What is the maximum level? That's the only question that remains. The maximum level of combinations that can exist in that tree, the vertical tree, can probably be a certain amount. What? I don't know. But this is what we see. So in other words, the formula is simple. A person is nothing more than a specific act of awareness. Each one is an act of awareness. And the awareness that he's, an, that he's a part of is a combination of certain spheres because the spheres are simply acts of awareness according to the Amida of Chesed, Din, and Rachamim. So we have some idea of how many people God has to make so that each one has to massacre its own combination. That's what it turns out. Now the, the Gemara says that when a certain number of combinations are created and mankind is created to represent these combinations and each one has to massacre his own combination. So when he's born in the physical life, his life looks like that combination of spheres that he is. So if a person is really a combination of what? Of, uh, of, of chesed, of, of a combination of chokhmah and, and keser, his life will be a reflection of that nam besufa. So each person is a reflection of a certain type of nam besufa that's made up of the interaction of certain types of spheres, because each one is defined as a person. So this is my theory, based on the fact that the spheres are really acts of awareness, that there are fundamentally three acts of awareness, chesedin and rahman, which subdivide into ten. And these ten subdivide into ten of ten of ten of ten and ten in a vertical direction. So there are more and more people, each one being a certain combination represented in that tree. And when all of those people are born and they all massacre their combination of spheres, that's when the gula will happen. So if God wants to save all the people to all the combinations, each one of those people have to be born in Olam Hazer, the physical universe, as a combination of a soul and a goof. And he has to massacre his combination of spheres or awareness. And that constitutes the Gula or the ultimate tikkun of all of mankind. So that's my theory. I hope I've explained it in a pretty good degree and that you all understand that unfortunately I would like to, I really should draw a diagram of exactly what I'm talking about, but I can't do that on the phone. But that's basically what it is. So that gives us some idea of what a person is. A person represents the awareness of a certain combination of seers. And he has to be uh, second, the nam sufa that's associated with that combination. Let's say he doesn't massacre it. So then God 
brings him back to Masakit with different Gurgulam, different reincarnations. Or it's possible that he doesn't, that another person could take on that role, that Sif combination. So these are the rules of reincarnation. But the rules of reincarnation are based on these, what's called, each combination is called a nitsutz. It's called a spark. A spark of all the spheres together. And each person represents the awareness included in that combination. That's called a spark, a nitsutz. Right. So fundamentally, that's my theory of what a person is. Okay. So, uh, did you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a question? Yes. Yeah, code, code of Hachet. What was, did Rachman exist? Kodam Hachet, you're saying that the spheres were a combination of the three and Huggas, but before the Chait, Rachman only, came, from my understanding, came into effect after the Chait in order to resolve you know, yes. how to go forward. Rachman did exist, except that it wasn't operational yet because other Mauritians didn't sin. But it had the potential to be operational. So therefore, the sphere, the awareness of Rachman did exist, but not as an operational sphere, an operational awareness. After the sin, Rachman became operational. And the other follow-up is that uh, you said at the very beginning of the shir that the reason for pain and suffering is to uh, take away some of that independence, to make people aware, you know, that right. they... To make, to like, make like a... Suffering make, to, right. But that wouldn't right. have applied mm-hmm. at the beginning, that there was no need. Why? Only afterwards. So Rachamim doesn't become operational until after the Chait, when you need Rachamim to be operational. Now, how this all works out in terms of the combinations, it's a vast picture, and it's something that the Rebbe is continuously aware of in fixing mankind, the Zolosoi. Because whereas in the beginning, the Zolosoi was one person or two people, Adam and Chava, now mankind becomes a representation of each specific combination. So it becomes much more complex. But that means that the person that you meet in your life, that means the strangers you meet, the friends that you have, the relatives that you have, and finally your own family, all of that represents a specific outlay of, 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 of combinations. How that works, we don't know. But this is what determines the muzzle of each person as he exists in life. And when we understand what the specific combination accrues to each person, then we will understand why his life looks like the way it does. It was to enable him to massacre his Namdik Sufa with a specific combination of spheres that appears. So only God knows exactly the combination that each person. And in a certain way, you can see the combination on the person. If you look at his hand and you look at his forehead, probably there's a certain way to figure out exactly at what level he is at and what combination he actually represents. Rebbe, do you know your combination? No. No. Well, in a certain way, maybe. But uh, is it for certain? No. How did Goyen fit into this? Because it seems like they abdicated their whole job yeah. Well, it's that, of his, and now there's billions of them. Yes, right. In a certain way, Goyim uh, abdicated from the system. So they represent, they represent a combination 
all of them together in one combination of something, going uh, someone outside of this tree of combinations. You know, exactly how it represents itself, I don't know. But the fundamental difference between the Jew and the Goy is a Jew can construct Olam Haba and Masakin his Nam Dixufa. A Goy cannot construct it, but he can live in Olam Haba. He can simply share that on a much lower level, but he cannot construct it. So somehow the combinations change. It's, it's uh, so and strange I believe there should be so many of them. Yeah, well, it, it, even though there's so many, as you grow in number and you become more and more, each number becomes smaller and smaller. So the goyim oh. are so many because they're really very small. You know, when you when you are the one billion person that was born, you know, obviously you're a combination of the tree at the very bottom of where the tree ends. You know, it's only the souls which are at the top levels that the higher souls, because they represent much smaller combinations. So that also has to do with the level of the soul. The further you are away from the top of the tree, the smaller combination, the more you will represent the combination, but the smaller does each combination fit in your soul. But, you know, you have to work that all out mathematically. Uh-huh. The... Uh... When you were de- describing Namzik Sufa, it was completely it seemed, uh, opposite of what the Ramchal says. Is there any way to re- reconcile it? That's a very good question. It appears my, my concept of Sufa is that what you're trying to fix, when you fix your Namzik Sufa, you're trying to fix something which disqualifies you from Olam Haba. So... Nam the Sufa becomes a problem in the, your ability to accept Olam Haba. You know, because you have a certain combination of independence that wants to reject Olam Haba. So therefore, you have to fix a disqualification. But according to Ram Chau, Nam the Sufa is not that you have to fix a discombination, but you have to fix, uh, you have to earn it. So it's a, that's a very, because you will not accept something which you haven't learned. So the Ramchal does not actually say what I say. But when you look at Yari, Yari does seem to indicate what I say. Because Yari says that in Nam Sufa, when you fix Nam Sufa, suddenly you become worthy of Olam Abba. So that's a different language. The concept of worthiness means before you become worthy, you are unworthy. That means that there's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean that you haven't corrected the situation by making something, uh, by earning something. It means that there is something wrong with you. So when you look at the Ari's language, you see that it fits with what I say. Yeah. Because before you fix your Nam Sufa, you're no longer worthy. You're, you are unworthy. And you have to make yourself, by fixing Nam the Sufa, yourself to be worthy. And that seems to indicate that there's a flaw in you. And that flaw has to be corrected. And that yeah. fits to what I'm saying. What Imam Khal says that the flaw in you is not a real flaw. It's simply that you won't accept. Unless you've earned it, you will not accept it. So he avoids this whole concept that you're flawed. Yeah. Even though the Gomorrah says, the Gomorrah actually describes the flaw because the Gomorrah says that if you don't fix your Nam the Sufa, you know, if you don't earn all, the Gomorrah simply says that if you don't fix, if you don't fix the flaw, that you have to earn it yourself to accept it. But that's not really a flaw. No. You know, it's, the, the, the Gemara simply tells us what the flaw is. That if you, if, you don't, if you don't do it, you can't accept it because it disempowers you. But the fact that it disempowers you seems to indicate that it's a flaw. 
So that seems to go along with what I say. That if you don't fix your Namak Sufa, you're flawed and you won't accept it. Why? Because you're embarrassed. Where does the embarrassment take place? Who makes you embarrassed? Does God make you embarrassed? No. You are embarrassed. Why? Because you feel independent and you don't feel you need Olam Haba. So when you look at the Gemara, when you look at the Diyari, Diyari seems to be saying that it's not a question of earning something. It's a question of removing something which would cause you to reject Olam Haba. Do you know what I mean? Right. You see, so, so where the Ramchal gets this concept of earning it, that you can only become a real Baal when you've earned something, I don't know. That seems to be something the way he understands it. But the way I understand it, it's a flaw. And it's not that you haven't earned it. It's that you're not qualified to be an Olam Haba because you feel you're independent and you will reject Olam Haba. And that's what God did. So therefore, the process of Tikkun of Olam Haba and Sufa is the highest process of all because God had to give a way where the human being, the entity, the Zulosoy, can actually remove this flaw and not reject Olam Haba. That's the real problem that God has. And this problem only exists in, a, in an entity which, which has an awareness of itself. Because an entity which has an awareness of itself, you see, knows itself by itself. So where does, where did, where did Ramchal get this concept? Uh, I'm not clear where he gets this concept, but it seems to be something that he's saying. That it's a question of earning it. Whereas I say, it's not a question of earning anything. You don't have to earn something, you know, because first of all, God is a giver. So you, there's no reason in the world why you have to earn something if God is an absolute giver, because God wants to give. So why do you have to earn anything? So it's more like what I'm saying could be true, that you don't have to earn something. You simply have to remove the sense of why you would reject all of my ball. It's a question of becoming worthy or becoming, you know, that seems to be much more the issue of what's taking place. Yeah, but you could say God is giving you the opportunity to earn it. In other words, you've got to, have the, you've got to be offered the job in order to be able to earn it. Yeah, but when you earn something, that's arbitrary. You can earn this or you can earn that. What I'm saying is you have to, you have to not earn it. You have to remove the flaw of Nam the Sufa, or else you will reject it. That's a different concept. Nam the Sufa is a problem in rejecting all of my ball. It's not a problem in earning all of my ball. Is it, is it accurate to say, to kind of like uh, make this um, analogous to femininity and masculinity? Let's say the wrong hall is kind of like seeing a masculine vort and you're seeing a feminine vort. No. The, to be the ultimate acceptor, uh, Nakabo, like a woman. Yeah, but that concept of giving and taking is a subdivision of the Zerosari. It does not exist in God. Nam Suf is a problem that every Zerosari has, whether he's masculine or feminine. A woman also has a problem with Nam Sufa, which means if she knows herself by herself, she would also reject Olam Haba, even though the woman is a taker, fundamentally. But she would have a problem. You know, a woman is not a uh, potter from, Ola, from, from rejecting Olam Haba. She has the same problem with Nam Sufa as the man, because she is a definition of Zulasa, she knows herself by herself, so she also considers herself uh, independent. Maybe she doesn't have as strong. The woman does not have as powerful a problem of Nam Sufa as a man. That may be true. But she has that problem, and therefore she has to correct. So when the Nochash, when the snake, he first chose woman, because maybe, maybe she was... Uh, less, less flawed. 
So it was, it was easier to seduce her. I don't know. This is all related to why the Nochash chose to go to the woman and not to Adam Arishan. 